So hello and welcome to Conversations Activating Inuit Art Sovereignty. My name is Alison Hardwick. I'm originally from Nunatsivit and currently live in Toronto where I work at the Inuit Art Foundation. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the main offices of the Inuit Art Foundation are located on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, this place is to home to many, including a diverse urban indigenous community of Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. Conversations is a series of six live webinars across 2021, bringing together Canadian and Alaskan Inuit for moderated discussions with audience participation, providing information and insights on subjects important to Indigenous communities. Today's conversation will be recorded and posted at the website provided in the Q&A window. Previous conversations are also posted for you to watch, rewatch, and share. Our conversation today focuses on activating Inuit sovereignty with the art community, spaces, and beyond. The moderator today is Emily Laurent Henderson, who is a Greenlandic and settler writer and arts administrator based in Toronto, Ontario. Her work has been featured in the Inuit Art Quarterly, C Magazine, Studio Magazine, and Imaginative. Our speakers today include Therese Tungaluk and Daly Sambodoro. Therese Tungaluk is an artist and advisor for the government of Nunavut in the Department of Arts and Traditional Economy that hails from, and she hails from Rankin, Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. This year, she was appointed to the board of the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Art Gallery and the Indigenous Advisory Committee of the Kamayuk, the WAG's new Inuit Art Center. Daly Samodoro is an Inuit Alaska advocate for Indigenous rights, as well as an expert in international human rights law, international relations, and Alaska Native rights. This is just a small portion of what all these people are doing. So if you want to learn more, um, including seeing some website links, it's available on the event website. And I highly recommend seeing all the amazing things these women are doing. Thank you so much for coming, Nakumik, and over to Emily to start the conversation. Hi and good afternoon. Thanks for the introduction, Allison. Um, like stated, I am also based in Toronto here in Dish with One Spoon territory. Um, and I'd like to start by just opening up the conversation by asking and, and getting us all starting to think about what Inuit art sovereignty means to us. Um, and obviously we've all come here, maybe everyone already has their own opinions on what that means, or maybe you have questions about what that means. And so I would really like to pass it over first to Daly. Um, would you like to give us sort of what is your take or how would you define Inuit art sovereignty? Thank you, Kriana, um, for the opportunity. I think um, right off the bat, it's important to recognize that um, everything about us as Indigenous peoples, as, as Inuit, in terms of our status and our rights and our role, um, are sourced in self-determination. And as affirmed in international law, all peoples have the right of self-determination, including Indigenous peoples. And this is reflected in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly September 13th, 2007. And the, the, very, the very plain but, but significant language of Article 3 in the UN Declaration indicating that all Indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of this right, we have the right to determine our political status and to freely pursue our economic, social, and cultural development. And if you think about Inuit art sovereignty, one can say that our cultural expressions, including art in all of its various different mediums uh, is, is sourced in the right of self-determination. Um, our, our interrelated, uh, interdependent and indivisible rights um, to, to culture and identity and all of its expressions, including the, the creative expressions uh, through art, again, in all its mediums, is, is really found in um, the, this right of self-determination and how we have expressed it um, for, for centuries. And uh, I think that 
the, the term sovereignty in and of itself invokes a wide range of elements about our cultural expressions. And I could go deeper into some of the more explicit language of the UN Declaration, but I think just to answer that straightforward question about our views on Inuit art sovereignty, uh, that the main response I wanna give is that it is sourced in, in our right of self-determination as distinct peoples and, and peoples that do have distinct uh, status, a distinct um, a framework of rights and uh, a distinct role in terms of um, our outward expressions uh, toward all of humanity, but also internally and within our own communities. Kiana. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it over now to Tracy. Uh, Tracy, if you would like to add your own thoughts. What I think about Inuit art sovereignty is um, to be able to have our own collective uh, indigenous intellectual property, whether they be tangible or intangible. Um, we do have that right to protect our art, to protect our creations, even our ideas need to be protected. And for that particular reason, we do need to have that uh, indigenous intellectual property um, become law. For Inuit, we have had or, or Inuit history, mm -hmm. all simply because we don't have any trees and we didn't have paper and pen in our tents and igloos. And so everything that was made into law regarding productions and creations, uh, it was it was meant to respect the person who came with the idea first. And it was also meant to um, respect the person who made something first. And so let's say my mom made an amauti, and amauti is something we carry our baby in our backs. Mm -hmm. As soon as it comes from the tummy, it goes to our back. So there's always that. Um, flesh touching all the time. Mm. And if she made an amalti and somebody else wanted to copy her exact pattern, uh, let's say Susan decided to make an amalti just like what my mom made, mm. she would have to approach my mom and ask her if she would be allowed to make similar or the same pattern as my mom. The consent, the consent is the legal binding between words, between two people. And uh, if my mom said yes, then she can help her and show her how to make the pattern. And she would also, if she wanted to, she could say, yes, you may share this with this pattern with your family. Or my mom would say, I have given this pattern to you in trust. So therefore I want you and only you to be able to use my pattern. And so those kinds of words were very important because we had no papers to document anything. So the word of mouth in those days, even it came to creations of tools and toys and clothing and you know um it was very important to follow that even with intangible things mm -hmm. someone mm -hmm. who who wrote a song even if they wanted to use a short part of the lyric or some of the words then they would need it was expected of that person who is now writing a new song, if they wanted to borrow someone else's bits of words or bits of the tune of it, then mm. they would have to have the agreement between that per person whom they're asking. And mm. so that's how uh, indigenous intellectual property was quite alive within Inuit oral history. Mm. Um, and we, I think we really, as indigenous people, uh, our art came from leftovers of what made 
was was made from a bigger item, like if you made a kudlet, then you had leftover um, soapstone, so you carved that, or you made something out of ivory. You know, if you you made your dog hitches with ivory, then the leftovers are used to make toys for the kids or barrettes or comb, you know, and uh, we were very resourceful with the natural resources that we had within our environment. And so I believe strongly too that um, uh, we should be able to manage our own wildlife and re renewable resources and use the resources the way we wanted or within the new, new modern system. Mm. I, I think um, if we look at yesteryear on the old igloo days, they really had good laws that kept peace with everyone. It, it showed that there was respect for the creators, for the first people who had ideas, for the people who, who were willing to share their wealth of um, skills with mm -hmm. other people because we could only survive as a people by sharing. Mm -hmm. we, we were known a lot to be able to share many of our knowledges, many of our, you know, that's why we had so many Inukshuit, mm -hmm. those Inukshuit, were our land um, signs. Mm. They showed you which way to go. They showed you uh, which leg would be the best for fishing. And so many of our uh, indigenous uh, creations have, have so much strength in them. And I think that we should get back doing to that again so that there is fairness again and there is more, you know, um, peace among ourselves. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much. And I think that's such a great segue because what I've been thinking about in terms of Inuit art sovereignty builds a lot, I think, on both what Daly has said and Teresi has said, which is self-determination over our own futures. Mm. Um, and, you know, spending the bulk of my early career now working primarily with emerging career artists or early career artists. Um, just seeing ways that uh, artists can be supported, you know, artists can be supported to, to draw on these really powerful traditions, um, to continue them on in, in the way that, that we're determining as Inuit and the way that we see fit and appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really, really powerful point uh, right there, which brings me sort of, I guess, into a conversation about a sort of a broad conversation we had, I think, in a preliminary call about access. And some of that is, is access um, to Inuit art uh, collections for Inuit or to be able to access education or materials. Um, so how do you think, uh, daily? we'll start with you, how do you think that access either to uh, collections to education or to materials helps influence uh, Inuit art sovereignty and assure Inuit art sovereignty for Inuit going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I uh, before answering that specific question, I do want to build on uh, something that Teresa has said about intellectual property and and how, um, uh, in fact, if you think about how indigenous human rights are framed in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's not about uh, the creation of any new rights. It's actually about uh, taking the perspective that Teresa has just now shared and, and uh, finding a way to, to anchor it in a, a human rights framework to ensure that those rights to intellectual property and the protocols that she just described have been safeguarded in really explicit terms. And, and I, I just want to um, uh, cite that in the, in the preamble of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, there are numerous references to our culture and and, and one, of the, one of the key uh, elements, and it goes to what she said, um, about intellectual property is that 
that we as Indigenous peoples have much to contribute in terms of the diversity and the richness of, of civilization and cultures, and that we, we have much to contribute to humankind, and th that all these protocols that she described um, are, are a part of this. And the, the other expressions um, have been uh, crystallized in the form of, for example, um, Article 11 of the UN Declaration. And I, I just wanna read this um, because I think there are many who don't understand the important link, linkage between our cultural expressions and intellectual property and indigenous knowledge and, and the right, right? The sovereignty that we're talking about. So Article 11 of the UN Declaration indicates that indigenous peoples have the right to practice and revitalize their cultural traditions and customs. This includes the right to maintain, protect and develop the past, present and future manifestations of their cultures such as archeological and historical sites, artifacts, designs, ceremonies, technologies, and visual and performing arts and literature. I mean, this is really expansive language, but it goes also in the second paragraph to uh, the need for governments uh, and others to provide mechanisms that ensure that respect for our cultural, intellectual, religious, and spiritual property taken without our free, prior, and informed consent or in violation of our own laws and protocols and traditions and customs that we have to have access to to redress, we have to have an effective mechanism to ensure that that intellectual property or our knowledge and our designs um, as ex as cultural expressions uh, that are taken without our consent that that we have a way to to redress or recourse and, and correct those wrongs. And, um, and governments have a responsibility through a variety of different uh, uh, pathways to safeguard this. If we think about um, UNESCO alone, for example, right? In terms of education, science, and culture, UNESCO should be undertaking initiatives consistent with the way these rights have been affirmed in the UN Declaration. In my assessment, they're not doing enough. Or if you think about the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, CITES, and the, and the international trade, which goes to your question about access, there has to be coherence and coordination between those international treaties and the rights that have been affirmed in the UN Declaration. There has to be an intersection. There has to be a linkage between our expressions of intellectual property, our cultural expressions through design and art, uh, including things like the, the, the example that Teresa described of an, a, a woman's amauti, which is personal to her and, and how it may be shared with others. But going to your question about access, these international treaties that uh, may ultimately diminish our ability to access the resources that are needed for these cultural expressions and art Again, they have to be they have to be aligned with rather than the current situation where there's a total misalignment. You know, uh, CITES um, and and nation states. You know, I I understand the desire for um, us to ensure that elephant poaching doesn't take place in Africa. Right? Who would be against that? We don't we 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 don't. Um, uh, we don't support anything like that. Yet at the same time, our access to ivory, for example, our access to walrus ivory, we got thrown under the bus because those in the United States 
don't understand the significance of, of ivory to our people and the, and the centuries old usage of, of access to and, and, and working with um, ivory for a whole host of uh, purposes and, and reasons from, from you know, uh, tools and implements as well as adornment and, and, and carvings. And so when we, when we bump into these issues of denial of access by forces that don't understand our worldviews and our world perspectives and our basic day-to-day -day use of such materials, um, it signals that there's an extraordinary amount of education that has to take place uh, in order to ensure that our distinct rights as users of ivory, as users of sealskin, as users of, of uh, again, a wide array of, of um, in English byproducts, right? You know, we need the access and we need unfettered access consistent with the way that we always have had access. Um, uh, sorry to be long-winded about it, but I think that I think that 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 this framework of our human rights, you know, we have governments that, uh, and others like animal rights organizations that that lack the capacity and lack the understanding of the way that uh, we have a profound relationship with everything in our environment, including the animals and the and 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 what we have been able to um, create uh, based upon the these profound relationships um, uh, with uh, with everything in in our natural world and and the other dynamic I think is that this is still vital, right? There's still a vitality and a vigor. I mean, and Teresa, I can tell by just looking at her screen uh, on this image, it's right there. It's living. I think I see a still skin bag in the background. I think I see, you know, I mean, her jewelry, all of these things, they're still vital. They're still here and now and present today. Uh, hence the significance and importance of these, of these distinct rights. Thank you so much for that. And something I'd like to, to clarify for the audience too that may not know is, you know, like not necessarily just restricted in terms of uh, our sheer access to some of these materials, but also our ability to export uh, across across borders. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's a great segue because Teresi, you've done really extensive work regarding um, being able to access, um, not only access these materials, but also able to export them like in and out of Canada or the United States. Um, would you like to speak a little bit on your work with the National Animal Interest Alliance and, and sort of what came of that when you were, when you were in these discussions over, over the past couple decades? I will read something that I got a letter in the mail a couple of days ago, and it's from a non Inuk person, and it's regarding dealing with seal skin in Nunavut, seal skins in Nunavut, and byproducts. And me, she writes, the media will be looking for a spokesperson to make comments. I have been working on this campaign for over a year. This is a non in a person saying that she's worked on this for over a year. God damn it, I've lived it for 70 years. <laughs> you know, like, why can't I be a damn spokesperson? You know, and these still these things are still happening. We will always try to be stepped down, but because I'm not in the generation of my parents who were afraid of uh, non-Inuit people. I can speak up. I have written to that person. And I'm on that committee and none of the Inuit were mentioned to be, um, besides there's only four of us Inuit who are involved when there's uh, 34 involved, you know? And these things we have to change too. But um, I've been working on the, um, 
the rights for Inuit to use their own natural resources, especially the seal. And I went to a meeting in um, what is called the Alliance for, for America 11th Annual Flying for Freedom in Washington, DC. And the year before that, I had gone to Portland, Oregon to make a presentation on behalf of the Inuit in Nunavut. And so what happened at that first meeting in, um, in uh, Portland, Oregon, was that uh, we, I flew from my rank in Inlet Town to the capital in Iqaluit. We met with government people there because I was just a new government employee. And then we met more with the federal government in Ottawa with the DFAID, um, De Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. And they wanted to, they, they asked us five Inuit who were going down to Portland and they, at the end of our introductions, the Canadian guy asks us, so what is it you hope to accomplish? And I said, well, all I want at this point is to be understood. And as a Canadian federal person, his reply was, oh, good luck to you. It'll take 25 years before the Americans can hear whatever you're trying to say. At that point, I said, I don't care what you think. You didn't see what my dad went through. You never saw him when the Marine Mammal Protection Act came into effect. His hunting was uh, affected. How he could feed us and his husky dogs affected him. That Marine Mammal Protection Act affected his life so much because he was a hunter and he was a carver. And later on, he could not sell his ivory carvings outside of Canada. That's how much it affected the Inuit people. Uh, and I saw it with my own true eyes. I saw what my dad went through. He worried and he worried because he was so used to making sure we didn't get hungry. He, he made sure we had homes. And now his ability to, to do those very things were taken away from him. Not because the Inuit were over hunting, but part of Canadian, uh, of the Canadians were clubbing their for that reason, this right was taken away because of somebody else's action. But they never saw Canada as a whole. They never thought about the indigenous people, the Inuit people who relied on the seal so much. They never thought of that. They only thought of the poor little seal that got clubbed on the head. And so... Um, I made a speech and it was quite effective to the American people because there were at least, um, I think 700 in attendance. And so after they heard from us, they changed their whole agenda, which was a three day meeting to cater to the needs of Canadian Inuit and the ceiling industry that had been taken away from us uh, because the Marine Mammal Protection Act came into effect in 1972. And here's the resolution they made. The key observation arising from the Alliance for America 11th Annual Flying for Freedom is that the promotion of animal rights belief has produce unacceptable consequences that include ongoing violations of fundamental human rights. The representative of the Inuit people from Arctic Canada has eloquently described how their culture, livelihood, and society are being devastated by the animal rights inspired Marine Mammal Protection Act or the MMPA, a law which contradicts accepted principles of sustainable use and environmental conservation. This outdated legislation arbitrarily bans the import of seal products from an abundant species and violates the American ideal of individual freedom and the rights of people 
to self-determination, including the right to use and trade abundant local resources. We believe that the American people would be shocked and distressed to discover that the MMP, MMPA has so severely harmed so many people and cultures. Indigenous people attempt to live in harmony with the environment as active practitioners of sustain, sustainable use. The MMPA disrupts this ecological relationship. Seals are abundant in Arctic Canada and other regions and provide a vital source of food in Arctic communities. But provisions of the MMPA prevent Inuit and other people from fully utilizing animals upon which they depend for their survival because trade is pro prohibited. Therefore, this Assembly of the Alliance for America, one, calls for the amendment of the MMPA to allow an import of seal products to protect U.S. commercial and recreational fisheries and to bring the MMPA into accord with the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, which is CITES you spoke about, as implemented by the Endangered Species Act on agreement under the WTO and two resolves to work to inform the American public and legislators about the injustice which has been done by this law and three calls upon all people and organizations that respect human rights to join us in our efforts to right the wrongs that have been done. So this was a resolution uh, that was signed in, uh, that was drafted in Portland, Oregon in 2000. And in 2001, it was signed by the president of the uh, organization in May 20, 2001. But it never went to Congress. So it's still, the Marine Mammal Protection Act is alive and well and still pro prohibits Inuit to export and to use and to... We Inuit, one of our strong beliefs is that when you catch an animal that have been living like us and striving to live and you have to kill that animal in order to feed your family, then you have to give it respect by using all the use, all, all of its meat, all of its mm -hmm. skin and bones, you know. Because the way we saw it, that animal gave its life for us, our family to live. And so that belief has been very strong among Inuit for many, many centuries mm -hmm. until some law like this comes along and prevents you not to use the skin anymore, not to use the ivory to the fullest from the waters and the narwhals when we still eat the meat and that. So these are rights that have been infringed upon us. They have been taken away from us. Uh, we are lucky we can still use them in Canada and sell our products, but we cannot export. So our economical growth is suppressed mm -hmm. by this uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Tracy. I know that that's something that I think about all the time and, and my friends and I think about all the time, especially seeing the way that things like buying and selling uh, Inuit art and design products online has totally reshaped the game. Right. So mm -hmm. oftentimes my friends and I, we might see something like, oh, there's these beautiful um, ivory earrings, but because they're produced by um, Alaska Native or Alaska Inuit, then it's not something that's accessible to us, even though we would be ordering it ourselves. Or if we want to make it accessible to us, uh, there is a significant amount of, of, of paperwork to go through. We don't have that ability to, to freely buy, uh, buy, sell and trade with each other. 
which is unfortunate and and definitely hinders uh, access to markets. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would like to sort of uh, like I'm, I'm conscientious of the time and something I'd like to steer into that I would love to, to hear a little bit more uh, from both of you uh, that we discussed a little bit in a preliminary call also regarding uh, our, our access to markets is uh, the issue that we've raised about resale right. So for listeners who might be hearing about this for the first time, resale right is a right that's effective in at least, I think, 99 other countries globally that guarantees a 5% cut of sales made of Inuit art or any art uh, in a secondary market. For example, if a piece is sold at auction uh, for $200,000, then that artist or the artist's estate would receive a 5% cut of those profits. And... Uh, Teresi, I'd actually like you to maybe open this because I know that your your work with Carfac has also been really, you've done a lot of extensive work on this. Um, and if you'd like to sort of share a little bit uh, of your insights to that aspect of the market and that aspect of, of Inuit art sovereignty as well, I'd be, I would, I would love to hear more. Yeah. yeah. I've been with Carfax, I've been a member of an art, as an artist at the beginning, and then I I became a board member maybe four or five years ago, and now I'm on the executive council because I'm the vice president of Carfax at the moment. And at first, when I started talking or hearing about what uh, Carfax was trying to do, was that I was thinking, hmm, that seems a lot more work for the artists to do on top of what they have to do already, you know, but then later on, I realized, oh, it's their right. They have a right, you know. When, when musicians have uh, royalty rights, mm-hmm. why can't the visual artists have rights too? And so what the um, artist resale right does is if it can become law in Canada, then the visual artists uh, would be able to get royalties as well. That is if, the, if their artwork was resold, not the first time itself, it mm-hmm. has to be resold the second, the second time, the third and whatever else, how, how many times that one piece can be resold and bought again by galleries and um, museums and um, auction houses, you know, and it would, that piece of artwork, let's say this one uh, by Veronica Manila, Mm. let's say this wall hanging sold for uh, $3,000, she would be eligible 150 bucks, you know, if it's resold again to to an auction house or a gallery or you know a museum, but we don't have that law, so she would completely miss out on getting any royalties from any of those reselling um, of of the artwork. And so right now we are very busy in the process of trying to make sure that it becomes law in Canada. And the way we're going about it has been for many years, um, we've been working hard on it, but it's not up to the artists to make it law. It's Mm. up to the elected officials Mm. that must vote for it in in the house that can make it law. Mm. So, it's important that when you have your member of parliament to speak to them, to say you wish that they would voice this concern for them in the house, in parliament or, you know, so that it can begin to move at least because as much as we want it to happen, it really isn't in, isn't in our hands to make sure it becomes law. It is up to the elected officials, like the member of parliaments that have to vote for it in order to, for it to become law for Canada or any other country for that Mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. Daly, would you like to add your thoughts? Yeah, I would because um, 
this is an important analogy that Teresi has identified uh, in terms of, um, uh, as she said, in music and the resale of, of music and how that, that right to that expression, um, that the same should be afforded to uh, Inuit artists and artists generally in terms of visual arts. I think that um, the, the, one of the, the possibilities is um, not only, not only a need for especially Arctic nation states, either through the Arctic Council or through some other intergovernmental mechanism that they see how these laws are misaligned, um, which eventually criminalizes us, right? You know, that this is, the, this is the characterization that we're somehow breaking the law. When in fact, if you study the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, what we're doing is actually consistent with the law. We, I mean, the provisions are made to ensure that we, as the, as the original um, uh, owners uh, and users and harvesters of these um, marine mammals in particular, which as Teresa has said, has been a sustainable practice. And it's a, it goes to the core of the values of, of um, not letting anything go to waste. And you know what, what she expressed about the use of every, every, every piece, every part. Um, so there, the, this misalignment, there's opportunity in my opinion, either through the Arctic Council or through a, a UN uh, mechanism to create the alignment that's needed to remove this this uh, characterization that we're somehow doing something illegal because we're not, right? The, the, the provisions have been there to ensure that we can access these marine mammals and, and to stay true to our own values about the sustainable use and, the, and that relationship that exists um, between ourselves and the animals, you know, uh, that the Arctic Council, for example, on this issue of, uh, of, of taking a sealskin, uh, wearing a sealskin vest and going across the international border, across the border. I don't know how many, how many Inuit I have met that have had things confiscated from them simply because, and some of these things are prized and important possessions made by um, family members. I mean, it, I can get real emotional about this because how many times have, have, have we met people who've had taken uh, things taken from them and ultimately to be destroyed? with no recognition of or respect for, for its source, what it means to the individual or what it means to, to a, a community, uh, a collectivity for all of us. Um, so I, I think that through, if we, if we were to take Inuit art sovereignty to the next step, uh, to the next level, um, a, a campaign could be initiated to uh, have all of the Arctic eight states that are presently active in the Arctic Council to figure out how to resolve this issue directly in consultation and collaboration with us as the users, right? With us as the rights holders. And then have them force, you know, UNESCO and, and, and the, the, those who control CITES and others to, to bring these issues into alignment so that we're not, we're not we're not subject to uh, this erroneous oversight of our expressions and, and our use of, of materials. So I think that, that, this, that this 
these traditions, these customs based upon our traditional economic activity that, you know, we, we have to demand respect for Inuit art sovereignty and, and all of its expressions, not just the materials, but as Teresa said early on in this conversation, the intangible uh, elements as well. And I think there's, there's, there are too few that, that understand the significance of these issues uh, for an individual artist or their family or their community and for all of us across, across Inuit Nunat. I think that at the moment, it's the real drivers of such an effort would have to be individuals like you, Teresi, who are so eloquent about the expression um, uh, of, of Inuit art sovereignty. And uh, I'm sure that you could transcend all the borders and find um, other Inuit who feel exactly the same way you do. And to begin, you know, a real uh, strategic campaign to, to resolve this issue. I mean, it's ridiculous that the Inuit Circumpolar Council, when it holds a general assembly, has to have some guy or some woman um, appear uh, to ensure that, you know, that, that these regulations are, are uh, uh, consistently upheld. Uh, so that, you know, when we go to an ICC General Assembly for a cultural exchange and our drum dancing and our, whatever it is, you know, who, why is it that we have to actually have somebody check you at the border? What's this? And, oh, what's that? And, you know, do you have a tag and certificate for this and that? I mean, I think there, I think there are solutions ahead. And I guess that's what I'm, I, I really want to say is that, that, you, Teresa, and others as an inspiration to resolve these matters politically and legally, uh, that there are pathways forward. And, and one, of the, one of the foundations is uh, how our rights have been affirmed in instruments like the UN Declaration and the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, of which the United States and Canada are, uh, are parties to, right? I couldn't take this on uh, myself, but I, I hope that um, it at least maybe sparks some discussion about how it could be done in the future by, by Inuit artists, because it does, in the end of the day, have effect at the micro level, right, for individual families and, and, um, and, and access to you know, the, the financial resources at the individual level, but at the family and the collective level. So again, apologies for being long-winded, um, but I, I think there are ways to move forward. No, that's perfect. And that's actually a really excellent segue um, into what I wanted. You know, you said way forward, uh, solutions ahead. Um, and that's something, you know, I think about constantly is what is the Inuit arts landscape going to look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and how do we set ourselves up the best as possible um, so that Inuit art sovereignty is, is respected to the highest degree it can be. And I think that that's things, you know, we've iterated so much during this talk is, is, um, is rights and policy and having those aligned with Inuit realities um, and, and ensuring that there's access to materials and to markets. But um, something I even say all the time is uh, our own creative sovereignty and our ability to self-represent is, is harm reduction, right? Having Inuit as, uh, as leaders and as key decision makers in these issues, uh, people that are like rooted in community and rooted in, in I've already said it, but Inuit reality, um, making these decisions would probably lead to as you said, policy, laws, rights in alignment with our own realities. Mm -hmm. And so in saying that, um, as we're sort of coming, you know, we've got about 20 minutes left to speak before we start taking questions, um, 10, 20 minutes. Uh, I would like to hear from both of you, what does a path forward look like now? Uh, Teresi, if you'd like to contribute. Uh, one of the key key things that we can look at is education. 
education of our past to our future leaders, um, education so that it's not just a one-time thing, but an ongoing thing so that the, the knowledge grows rather than diminishing uh, the old traditional knowledge and that diminishing to keep it more alive we need to keep educating um, our own traditional knowledge and uh, our beliefs, our, our myth, our, the lives our grandparents had, so that when a per young person knows where the, her, his or her ancestry came from and what they lived like, that could be their strength. From mm -hmm. there, they can become themselves and move on as themselves, but also having a uh, cultural and um, I, an identity uh, to take with them rather than trying to discover who they are. If we off offer this education, then they are absorbing, absorbing it without becoming confused as to who they should ask or who they should contact. How can they get this information? If we can offer that kind of uh, create educational materials of our traditional knowledge and, and of the past so that the younger people can fly on their own, so mm. to say. Mm. Yeah, and, but also knowing where they come from can also make them uh, even more aggressive of what they may want to do, aggressive in a good way so that uh, they have desire. They won't feel stumped when they are asked, what, what is it like to be an Inu, you mm. know? Because they will have had that uh, education that they so need because it's not really taught in schools at the moment yet, even though there has been some um, started in Nunavut, some some years ago on how to have uh, uh, relationships and all this, you know, even long ago, our marriage marriages used to be arranged, you know, you, you were made to marry someone you weren't even in love with, mm -hmm. but this was to make sure you didn't marry bloodline. It was to make sure that you you will have a family to continue to help you and grow you and and have family yourself on your own independently. It was all planned for survival, survival, mm -hmm. survival, survival. And so I think some of these things, although we never want back want to go back to arrange marriages. Um, some of the things that were done in order for the sake of survival were, were the very daily lives of Inuit so that here we are today. Here we are today being able to speak two languages or three languages. Here we are today, you know, able to express ourselves freely without having fear, you know, and we can you know, we don't believe in missionaries anymore that tell us, don't sing your songs, they're evil, they belong to the devil. We don't listen to that bullshit anymore. We know it's, <laughs> sorry, we don't, you know, we know too, not just them knowing, or mm. so they thought they knew. Mm. We are also able to voice ourselves. This, we are the future of our parents. And now our children, we want them to do even better than us, you know? I guess in a way, our future is in our hands. Yours, 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 mine, mm. you know? Pass the knowledge on. Mm. I think um, it would be a great idea to start, you know, working on some of the Inuit traditional knowledge. Yeah. You know, I know some of those books are already published in only in inuktitut and, you know, childbearing, you know, hunting and clothing making and so on, but they're in inuktitut. And, uh, but it would be nice to have them in the language which the young people speak in today mm -hmm. so that uh, they have access 
they have more access to. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Something that gives me hope constantly and makes me very emotional, I think, um, is just seeing the full breadth of uh, Inuit expression. You know, mm -hmm. we're not we're not a large population on Canada, not globally, um, but just the sheer amount of of creative energy that that Inuit produce every year and the way it constantly changes and evolves and uh, seeing so many of, of my own friends and colleagues just uh, taking things like from that are grounded in traditional knowledge and grounded in, in traditional art forms and making it their own and seeing it constantly live and grow and evolve and breathe. Um, you know, even my earrings today, uh, shout out Hannah Tuktu from Nunavik, um, things like that. You know, we've got caribou, got caribou tactic, caribou hide, beading. It's something that's really rooted and grounded in, um, you know, traditional aesthetics and knowledge, but it's contemporary. And now it's, it's something that lives with me every day um, in my own life and my own lifestyle, even though I live in the city. Um, and, and seeing that, you know, I can listen to a plethora of Inuit musicians. I can, mm. I, I have a constant, um, I've got so many artists to go look at and see in the galleries. Um, I, I can read Inuit writers um, and just that creative energy and knowing that momentum is carrying forward into the future and that we're going to continue to, to build and, and self-represent that way is really, really encouraging to me. And uh, daily, I'd love to to hear your thoughts on this as well before we close out for uh, for some questions. Yeah, really, really quickly. I think that um, Teresa has hit on something really important and that's that's education and social learning. I think that, that uh, there are so many that uh, lack an understanding of Inuit worldviews and perspectives and uh, that exchange that, um, you referenced earlier, uh, Teresa, about the resolution that was adopted recognizing the, the stifling nature of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. You know, that came out of, that came out of your expressions of, um, as an artist, as an advocate um, to, to raise awareness and that we need, in terms of the future, we need, we need more of that. And so to encourage dialogue and to encourage exchange. I think that um, the writing that is possible, um, I know that there have been uh, a number of uh, books that have been put out specifically about uh, intellectual property, indigenous, indigenous um, perspectives of, of cultural expressions and that I would encourage more and maybe uh, the possibility of, um, of such uh, projects completely Inuit driven um, and maybe from across the whole of uh, Inuit Nunat. I think the opportunity for maybe um, encouraging some of our performing artists, uh, especially to play a role in raising that, that uh, raising awareness and, and encouraging um, dialogue uh, through their own performances, you know? I mean, think about what might be possible for, um, for um, Inuit performing artists to tackle the issues of access to the materials that we have traditionally used and, and getting this messaging out through, through performing artists uh, as one possible medium. But I think also one opportunity is for Inuit artists to lay down some basic principles about Inuit art sovereignty, to write and prepare their own uh, guidelines about how the rest of the world community should respect and recognize Inuit art sovereignty, even if it's just one page, right? I mean, something that something that that could be done that might resonate with uh, Inuit artists across uh, across the imposed borders that we live with, and and might you know trigger some other developments. Those are just some initial ideas, but I think at the core of it is education and, and, and both inwardly in terms of our own, our own people, as well as outwardly. Uh, I think something that you, Emily, said is that we are a small, 
a small population. Uh, when I was elected as the chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, I, I told um, uh, the delegates that there are 9.6 billion people on earth and Inuit are only approximately 180,000. We're like 0.00001% of the world's population. But at the same time, we have extraordinary capacity. We have extraordinary ingenuity. We have extraordinary uh, ability to adapt. And uh, I think that if we, if we find the roots to uh, organize around these issues of Inuit art sovereignty, especially by the Inuit artists themselves, uh, we can't go wrong in, in chipping away at all the barriers and challenges that, that do exist for us. So those are just some of my ideas about the, about the way forward. Again, thank you for the opportunity and the, the, the questions. Thank you so much. I think that was such a productive chat. Um, Allison, I'm gonna pass it over to you. So I think it's question period. <laughs> It is. This has been such an amazing conversation to listen in on. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so the first question I have for everyone um, would be, how would you get consent to use part of someone's intellectual property after someone has passed on? Anyone feel free to jump in of, of what thoughts you have there. One of the ways that um, I know that um, just a few years back, uh, I had a neighbor, elderly neighbor. I wanted to, I was asked to make a smaller little girl, a Maltie, for a four-year-old. And although I make a Maltie, I didn't know how to make for a small person. So I went to this elder and I asked her if she could help me cut out a pattern that I can use for this little girl. She said, yes, under one condition, you will not share that pattern with anyone. And so there was that um, unwritten uh, agreement between her and I. But there are other people who will say, use my pattern, use, to, use it to learn. Then you can come up with your own design later on. You know, so there are different peoples out there. It's not just one way. There are flexibilities among different people that uh, that how you can use intellectual property and, and also to be able to, you know, uh, there are those that want to just, you know, once they've acquired a knowledge of how to do things, then they are, they become teachers, they teach, many younger people and but at the same time encourage them to become their own to to do different things the way they feel fits them better on themselves hmm. daily i was wondering if you had any thoughts about that as well well that's a really delicate question um but i think that uh it it and as Teresa is suggesting that it, it really is subjective to some extent, you know, the individual and how, and how they have um, created something and their desire to, to share it or whatever their um, prerogatives or, or their wishes happen to be. Um, but I, I think in terms of, um, in terms of some of the, some of this understanding, we it, it it depends on the, uh, for example, the importance of the collective nature of some of the knowledge that we have, and I think about this in terms of uh, the kayak, right? It says it, they're all over the world, right? There are plastic ones, there are millions of them, probably billions of them, and and I thought about it when Teresa talked about the resale right. Oh yeah, I mean, if you think about that alone, um, in terms of the, in terms of the, the 
the ingenuity that is out there now. And that's just one example, right? Uh, I mean, the Ulu, the, uh, or if you think about it in the context of other indigenous peoples, Kinoa, right? And the, the and, and, and seeds and all kinds of other uh, expressions. Um, this is a it's a it's a harder thing, but at the same time, maybe at the at the micro level, in terms of um, a creation that, uh, especially after um, person passes, that you know the the family or 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 others. I you know I re I really don't know. I haven't haven't thought about that. Um, to any uh, detailed extent, but I think that safeguarding it, uh, safeguarding such implements or expressions is, it's a question again, of maybe the, the collectivity kind of determining and deciding. Um, I don't I don't really know, I'd, I'd have to ponder that further. So, but thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah no worries, yeah. definitely um, not. Go ahead, Tracy, sorry. Yeah. When a family passes, let's say an artist passes and they have lots of artwork and things like that. And um, this is when it becomes very important for an artist who, who may be passing on soon to have a will. If they name someone in that will who will become the beneficiary or, or the estate of his or her artwork, then it's legally binded to the um, the will. This is how things can be done today. So it's very important that you know you write a will. This is one way to protect uh, your family art staying in the family or you know other other respectful things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One thing that I think about all the time, um, you know, if we were to go back and think about what was considered uh, Inuit art before there was an Inuit art trade, right? Now we're in an Inuit art trade or an Inuit arts economy. Um, prior to that, you know, it was our songs, dance, um, our clothes, our now tattoos, right? And the tattoos are really like, especially for young Inuit right now, like um, that's a, that's a big deal. That's a big conversation. And because, uh, our, our traditional tattoos were illegal for so long and outlawed, like I think broadly across the circumpolar worlds, there's, uh, not a lot of clarity on, on some patterns and, uh, what patterns belong to whom and how they should be used and when. And that has been uh, a really long ongoing conversation. I think right now about those patterns and those designs, um, in, in the broader Inuit community about who and when we've, we've, you know, we can sort of determine it's a closed practice for, for Inuit only, but like what certain patterns and, and designs mean when you should be getting them, where they should be placed. That's a really important conversation as well as um, all the way back to what Teresa was saying earlier about like the design for an Amauti, for example, like where my family's from, from in Greenland, a uh, family was, would have, uh, uh, their own patterns for beaded collars, right? And if you don't have, I'm fortunate. I have got, I've got images of of my family and and their their family patterns and everything. But sometimes um, when someone's passed on, or or um, there's been that disruption in in the passing on of knowledge, that's when you get in a tricky situation about determining like, you know, what you do have access to and and what's what's appropriate. And, and like Daly said, it's, it's a collective conversation. And I think it's something we're going to be working out amongst ourselves for a very long time. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, the next question I have, um, Daly spoke about the, the need to educate the public about the indigenous right to use the local sustainably harvest materials like ivory and seal skin. Uh, do any of you have any recommendations for how arts organizations and museums can collaborate with Inuit artists and activists to help with this education work? One example that I am familiar with is um, the issue that I spoke about earlier on the walrus ivory and uh, 
the proposed ban uh, here in the United States and how um, the, the, the original objective was uh, the poaching of elephants. Um, but uh, the reality was that the language was written in such a way that it would have um, been in direct conflict with uh, Inuit use of, of walrus ivory. And so uh, a, a campaign um, to educate people. And in fact, uh, most recently when I went to the COP26 of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, going to the airport, I was so impressed by this massive poster. It took up one whole wall and had a, a beautiful logo of a walrus. You know, some artists created the, the image, right? Um, but, but the messaging was about um, Inuit access to walrus ivory. And uh, so, I mean, this is, this is one, one way in which um, others, uh, including arts organizations, as well as galleries and whatnot, um, can, can assist by raising awareness. And, and I think that this is an area where, you know, my reference to uh, the preparation of some guidelines about Inuit art sovereignty might be useful. You know, it could be something that, that others hand out on a regular basis. I noticed in the chat the image of an igloo, the logo of an igloo. And here in Alaska, that's always been the, the hand um, uh, that appears on uh, something that is, is made by an Alaska native, um, including uh, walrus ivory and other, other materials. Um, so I think that efforts like that are, are really useful, but uh, maybe it all hinges upon how the artists themselves want to be safeguarded um, and having those conversations about the, the best way forward. Um, I'm just citing examples that, that I'm aware of that really help to increase knowledge about um, our, our sustainable practices and customs. But, but I think this, this is an area where I think Inuit artists themselves could really inform and drive the, the responses. In regards to the igloo tag, um, it was created in 1958, I believe, and it was to help Inuit or prevent Inuit from being copied. It was to authenticate Inuit art that it was, it was so such a, world widely known logo that it really helped sell Inuit art because some of the art collectors only looked for artwork that had the igloo tag because it indicated it was an authentic Inuit artwork. And it still happens that way, even though now that we in Nunavut have our own little tag to say that it's made in Nunavut, but the igloo tag is still much stronger than that. It ups the, the Inuit art sales. It gives collectors the visual they need to say it's authentic Inuit art. That's what they're looking for. That's what they will buy. And so that igloo tag has been such a big part of our family for a very long time among Inuit artists uh, because it was such a, uh, a re well world re recognized logo that it really helped with the sales of Inuit art. Yeah, something we didn't even really get to talk to because this is such a massive broad topic is, is, um, is appropriation, misappropriation um, and inauthentic Inuit art and, and, and the ways that that's been combated over the years. Uh, and Igloo Tag of course being at the forefront, um, at least in Canada. Of, of that conversation. I do have one more question um, and I'll read it now. <laughs> Thinking about going forward, how can I respectfully create my, create my own designs that are inspired by previous or older art or designs? 
as in how can I show appreciation of my designs, make sure that I'm not copying them or stealing their designs, for example, in beating uh, Twili or tattoo designs. I think one of the things that was always encouraged about, among Inuit is as you are learning, you are copying someone else's at first. But in the end, you are encouraged to come up with your own designs, to be able to add or take away and to, you know, let's say a form of art was like this. You started by learning how to do art in a form of this shape, you know, but as time goes and you become your own artist in your heart and in your mind, oh, I think it would be more interesting if I took a little line out here and added a little line here. And these are how you, you grow your artistic skills and you become yourself. And then from there on, you can say, ah, my own design. Mm. This, is, this is me. Nobody else made it. Mm. I am so proud to have it. I am so, so happy that I've learned to become myself. And so it is encouraged among Inuit who are just learning that they, when they are giving patterns, that yes, they can use it. But it's also encouraged that you become your own self. You know, you maybe you want to go to bigger designs or you may want to go to smaller designs it's who you are that will you know that have a relationship with that material that you are going to create it to something mm. that material and your heart and your imagination are the ones that will help create what you are holding in your hand and turn it into something yeah maybe also um, if there is an opportunity, uh, I, I really embrace what uh, Teresa has said about, about um, creation of, of, uh, of new design and, and adaptation. But also there's a, uh, if there is an opportunity then, uh, and if the artist is so inspired to, they can, they can honor those that they learned from, you know, by by referencing and acknowledging um, that they were inspired in 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 a way that uh, you know recognizes and acknowledges, but also uh, embraces what Teresi has said about about um, a new expression. Uh, I think there. I think there. Are, all kinds of opportunities, but it's uh, it really is dependent on how, what motivates uh, you know an, an individual artist. And but there is a, I think there is a lot of honor in in that in that expression of honor, right? Uh, people uh, and and acknowledgement that it's a it's a good thing because it it also go harkens back to something important that Teresa said earlier about sharing and and the way of Inuit values. Um, I think she said it in relation to the Inuks, you know, and where, where, as a guide, as a way to help, uh, to help others. So, this has been an excellent discussion. I really appreciate being included. So, and so good to learn of Tracy and her work. Um, it's hard on a screen. I don't know if you can tell I'm looking right at you. <laughs> I'm just uh, so, so, so happy uh, to, to um, hear of your, your work and your perspectives and also um, uh, grateful for Emily and Don and Allison as well for inviting Rihanna. I would love to say that I love the opening and closing with the visuals of the Inuk Suite as our guides as we're heading down this path, right? So thank you so much to Allison, Don, Catherine, to Tracy and Daly, um, and to the Inuit Art Foundation and the Smithsonian Arctic Studies Center. Uh, mm. Thank you very, very much. Mm. I'm just gonna do some closing out remarks. Um, mm. 
Thank you so much to moderator Emily Daly and Tracy for speaking. You guys are incredible. I, I love this series so much. It's been really, really enriching for, I know, a lot of uh, Inuit and non-Inuit folks. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to take the time to thank uh, also our Inuit advisory, uh, Sonia Keller-Combs, Casey Pruik-Kumigu Hobson, Krista Uluk, Uliuk Zawatsky and Takulik Partridge for their generous knowledge and guidance. Mm -hmm. um, the part one for this discussion was postponed from November 10th until December 16th. Um, so we're kind of going backwards in time, but it's going to kind of be a lot of part of this conversation. Um, it'll be more focused on the challenges to Inuit sovereignty. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And again, thank you so much to uh, this group. You guys were incredible and um, we really, really appreciate it here at the Inuit Art Foundation and Smithsonian Arctic Study Center. So I hope everyone has a great day and thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.